within occupied territory on the far left coast. You're listening to On The Move with Max Worley III. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, patriots and preppers. I am Mac Worley III, and this is On The Move, the show that attempts to inspire you to stand up for your rights. As I've said before, this is not my show. This is your show. This is your grassroots activism movement. It's the On The Move movement. It cannot function without you, however, it is bigger than one man. I want to thank each and every one of you for your patriotism and for taking the time to get involved. With that said, thank you for tuning in. Today is going to be a really great show. Today is January 12th, 2014, the year of our Lord. And today's episode is titled, Citizen Journalism. Today we're going to have a very special guest on the show, Dan Sandini of The Daylight Disinfected. Uh, We're going to be covering many topics uh, that have been in the news lately. We're going to be talking about the importance of citizen journalism. We're going to be talking about Obamacare and its effects on the economy and the economy in general. We're also going to be talking about much more. We're going to be taking listener calls and reading emails. So if you guys have anything on your mind, feel free to give us a call and we will have a conversation about it. If you'd like to join in the conversation today, uh, please uh, give us a call here at uh, 619-924-0986. That's 619-924-0986. Or you can email the show at onthemoveshow at gmail.com. You can also check us out at onthemoveshow.com, here at blogtalkradio.com forward slash onthemoveshow, facebook.com forward slash onthemoveshow, youtube.com forward slash onthemoveshow, and twitter.com forward slash onthemoveshow. Uh, If you want, you can check out our shop on there. We have uh, a whole bunch of uh, products on there, hundreds of products for sale on there, ranging from freeze-dried food to gear to show merchandise to clothes, to drinkware, to bumper stickers, and so much more. Anything that you guys purchase on there will help make our show bigger and better, and I just want to say thank you so much for your support. Before we get into the show today, I'd like to talk about one uh, new change that we're, we're going through here. Um, I've actually joined up with the Midnight Patriot, Jeff Norton of the Midnight Patriot, and uh, his, uh, his network that he's operating on over there. It's uh, patriotfacebook.com. Uh, it's basically a area, a website where patriots can go and have somewhere where they can all talk and not worry about being censored. Uh, it's basically just a, a place where we're building. It's a community, and Jeff is putting this all together, and it's it's really awesome. I'm really excited to join this. Uh, you know, it, it's it, we're still working out the technical details on it because. You know, I'm not really a computer guy. I don't know a whole lot about the process of it. And, you know, I'm still new to radio. I'm still working out the kinks of my program here. And Jeff is uh, taking upon himself to help me, and I really appreciate his help that he's doing. And, uh, you know, I, I really appreciate him taking an interest in me to have them um, ha- have me on their network. So I'm really excited about that. I'll keep you guys updated about all the moves that, that are going to be going on with that on uh, Facebook.com forward slash on the move show. And like I said, uh, please check out uh, PatriotFacebook.com. It's really cool. It's a great place. It's a real, uh, real cool Patriot hub. It's made for Patriots by Patriots. So you should really check it out. As far as changes on the show, uh, you're really not going to see a whole lot of uh, difference in the show. It, with the exception, of the quality will be better, and we'll be uh, sending you out a different link to check out the show uh, because we're going to be running through Spreaker uh, and Blog Talk at the same time. But the Spreaker link, link is what I'm going to send you guys, and that quality is, is a little bit better. I'm still going to be using Blog Talk so that we can use uh, phones at the same time, so uh, take telephone calls from listeners. So anyway, if you guys would be patient with me during that process, I'd really appreciate it. And uh, like I said, I'm really excited about it. I'm really excited about just this big network of people that we're, we're getting in touch with and how the, the message is being spread the, the patriot movement is, is growing, and you know we're linking together in all sorts of different avenues. So it's, it's really exciting. Um, anyway, today's first segment of the show uh, is the first segment we do every time is Today in History. Uh, so according to, day, to uh, Yahoo News, 99 years ago today, in 1915, the House of Representatives rejected uh, 204-174, which was a constitutional amendment giving uh, the women the right to vote. The key vote actually came out 
a few years later, five years later, uh, June 4th, 1920, when the Senate approved the amendment by 56 uh, to 25 after four hours of debate, during which Democratic senators opposed Opposed to the amendment, filibustered the to prevent a roll call until their absent senators could be protected by pairs. Anyway, what this means, uh, the eyes included 36 Republicans. That was at the time that was 82 percent of the Republicans in the Senate and 20 Democrats, which was 54 percent of the Democrats in the Senate. That's who supported women's suffrage, the right to vote. The nays comprised of eight Republicans which was 18% of the Republicans, and 17 Democrats, which was 46% of the Democrats. The 19th Amendment, which prohibited state and federal sex-based restrictions on voting, was ratified by sufficient states in 1920. Support for women's suffrage, again, that's the right to vote, was overwhelmingly supported by the Republican Party, which only 18% of uh, the party opposed it. In contrast, the uh, Democratic Party had 46% of their senators vote against women's suffrage. Why is the Democratic Party the party of feminists? This is consistently showing how the Democrats are on the wrong side of history. Um, this party is, is not, it historically has not been looking out for the little people, has, has not been looking out for the victims throughout history. In fact, they've they've been trying to perpetuate the victims. Uh, not only did they oppose women's suffrage, but they've also opposed the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which made it illegal to be discriminated against based on race or religion. So why is the Republican Party considered cold and heartless as a party? I want to hear what you guys have to say. Give us a call. The number to the show is 619-924-0986, or you can email the show at onthemoveshow at gmail.com. Um, if you don't want to be on the radio, if you're kind of shy a little bit or whatever, feel free to uh, to email us. That's one good way, and I'll just read your email live on the air. Okay, so now it's time for my favorite part of the show. It's called the Weekly Defender. And now it's time for the Weekly Defender. You have the right to defend your life, the right to defend your family. All right, in this segment, we report about armed citizens in the news who use their firearms to defend their family, property, and or themselves. Our first weekly defender we found on alabamas13.com. On December 18, 2013, in Birmingham, Alabama, a woman shot an ex-boyfriend who she found hiding in her house that night. According to Jefferson County Sheriff, the 32-year-old female called authorities around 7 p.m. that night to tell them that her ex-boyfriend had broken into her house and she had shot him. The victim says she went into the basement to smoke when she realized that her ex-boyfriend was in the basement. He smashed her phone when she tried to call 911 before chasing her around the basement. The woman took a gun from her pocket and shot the 34-year-old man in the leg. When he fled, he dropped his cell phone which she then used to call 911. The man was taken into custody around 8.30 p.m. and transported to the hospital for treatment for his injuries. Clark Allen Gray, age 34, of Pelham, was charged with aggravated stalking, second-degree domestic violence, third-degree burglary, and interference with a domestic violence call. He was still in jail as of December 26, 2013, but will be transferred to the Jefferson County Jail where he will be held in lieu of his $66,000 bond. Our next weekly defender we found on gun in, gunsandfreedom.com. When a couple of shoplifters tried to rip off a store in a mall in Glendale, Arizona, it was not the loss prevention officer that fired at them. In fact, an unarmed officer was found, found himself at gunpoint when he tried to stop the pair of shoplifters. It all began when the unarmed loss prevention officer tried to detain the thieves. One of the suspects, a woman, drew a handgun from her backpack and pointed it at the officer. Meanwhile, a 61-year-old man was sitting in the parking lot waiting for his wife to finish her shopping in the mall. He saw what was happening, and then he saw his wife exiting the store from the same entrance as the officer. 
Fearing for the safety of his wife and the loss prevention officer, the male fired his handgun an unknown number of times toward the armed suspect. There are witnesses who indicate that either one or more of the shoplifting suspects may have been hit by the gunfire. Both of the shoplifting suspects then got onto a black motorcycle and fled the area, stated Glendale Police Sergeant Jay O'Neill. The police found a motorcycle that matched the description of the suspect's getaway vehicle parked at a nearby apartment, but so far the suspects are still at large. If they did indeed suffer gunshot wounds from an armed citizen, it will be easier to track them down if they show up at any area hospitals, O'Neill said. At this time, it is not known if the charges will be brought against the men who fired the shots at the suspect. It, it, let me just note here quickly that it's perfectly within the bounds of the law uh, for firearms to be used in defense of another person, especially if you think that there's going to be a loss of life. Uh, also, let me just note that no shoppers were harmed during this incident. In fact, the would-be would robbers actually didn't even get to fire a shot uh, before they made their escape. So we at On The Move, we love hearing about how law-abiding citizens use their firearms to protect themselves. You have a right to defend your life. You have a right to defend your family. And you have a right to defend your freedom. We at On The Move support your rights. And if you have a story about how you lawfully defended yourself or would like to comment on one of the stories uh, that you've heard, we'd like to hear from you. Give us a call. The number is 619-924-0986. Again, that's 619-924-0986. Or you can email the show at onthemoveshow at gmail.com. All right, at this point, we're going to go ahead and take a quick break, and we will be right back after this commercial. on the move help us make this podcast bigger and better you can do this by going to our store and purchasing one of our hundreds of products all designs are original and made for patriots like you just go to cafepress.com slash on the move show we appreciate your support need design services logo design for ninety dollars business cards brochures bumper stickers signs flyers promotional products such as mugs pins bags keychains, magnets, and so much more. Contact Latasha Worley for a quote on your next project at Tasha, T-O-S-H-A, at lworleyphotography.com today. Or visit me on the web at lworleyphotography.com. And on Facebook at facebook.com slash lworleyphotography. And on Twitter at twitter.com slash Tasha Worley. Show your support for a designer who believes in the Constitution and your rights. And we're back. All right, the next segment of the show we're going, uh, we're actually starting is the, uh, it's called the Mac Attack, and we will be starting that right now. Alright, this segment of the show, I talk about outrageous news uh, that I've heard and basically things that, it's been, I basically just give you my take on these, these outrageous things I've heard in the news. Uh, one of the things that I'd like to talk about right now is uh, the New York City mayor. Uh, you may have heard that uh, Michael Bloomberg has been out of the uh, mayor business now. He's been replaced by Democrat Bill de Blasio. Alright, so... One thing that I'd actually just like to mention is a lot of people were like, yay, we're getting rid of Bloomberg. But I think that we're actually being – it's actually he's actually being replaced with somebody a lot worse. This man is a is, is an open socialist. He All of his policies that he, he agrees with are Marxist, socialist. Anyway, and on top of which, this guy's kind of corrupt. I'm looking at a story right now from theblaze.com, and uh, – you know, one thing that – the very first thing that de Blasio said that he was going to do when he went into office was that he was going to ban the horse carriages in New York City. Ban the horse carriages. Why is that something that you're worried about? Is Are they dying in droves or something over there? Are they getting hit by cars or something? Is, is it is that much? No, I, I looked. I You know, there's not really a whole crazy amount of horses being mistreated over there or hit with cars. 
So, so why is he really worried about that? Well, one, one theory is that the horse stables are actually on some pretty important land, some pretty expensive and valuable property in the, um, in the city of New York. Uh, currently, the stables consist of 64,000 square feet of valuable real estate on lots that could accommodate up to 150,000 square feet of development. These lots could be sold for new development. They, you know, so, so where does this leave us? This, this basically leaves us at a point where we're, we're watching a mayor start picking winner, winners and losers. This is the problem with big government. This is the problem when government starts involving themselves in our lives, and they start telling us what businesses are going to win, what businesses are going to lose. And he just, out of nowhere, you know, he has no legal backing for this, and I'm sure this is going to be appealed, but... I mean, it's going to take years for this to go through the court system. In the meantime, these these businesses that depend on these horses are are, are basically, you know, being put out of business. So, what's going to happen in this? I, I don't know, but I do think that this is just one small problem of this governor. Uh, you know, all of his agendas that that he stands by. Again, like I said, they're all socialism. It, it, it it's basically the same policies that we've seen in Detroit and California. New York was actually doing pretty good. You know, I, I don't like Mayor Bloomberg. I think he believes in the nanny state, and I, I think that he is probably a very good guy. That's my personal opinion. But I think he, we were better off with Bloomberg than we are with de Blasio. I think we're going to see in the next few years this city just go down the drain. And it's going to be you know pretty entertaining for people who aren't living in the city of New York, like myself. But... Uh, you know, I really feel for the people in New York that have to experience this. I, you know, I would really guess that a lot of the people in New York are going to be leaving, probably leaving in droves. And, um, you know, it, it's it's going to be hard on the businesses there. It, it's just going to be really difficult. I, he's also getting rid of the stop and frisk, which, you know, I'm not a big fan of stop and frisk. But, you know, it, it's being projected that crime rates are going to go through the roof. I, I don't know. I What I do know is that, uh, there are figures out there that crime rates uh, since stop and frisk has started have actually lowered. But, you know, I, I disagree with the fact that, that you need stop and frisk to actually lower crime rates. In my opinion, if you just stop making the city a gun-free zone, then that would probably do a whole lot to deter crime rather than having to worry about getting pat down by police and turning everyday law-abiding citizens into criminals we could just, I, I don't know, arm the citizens and allow them to defend themselves. And, you know, at that point, I think that would be a pretty good deterrent to crime. But, I, you know, I guess these people in these big cities, they, they don't believe in that. They don't believe in the Second Amendment. But I digress. Anyway, uh, we're going to be watching, really, the downfall of, of New York City. And it's just going to get bad. I, you know, mark my words, things in New York are going to get really horrible. Crime is going to sty- skyrocket. Businesses are going to leave. You're going to see a lot of poverty in there and obviously with that we're going to see more socialistic programs from this mayor he's going to you know have instead of basically putting people in a position to get themselves out of poverty he's going to put them in a position where they can be okay living in that poverty they can instead of getting a job to to excel out of that they're going to just be on the government you know on on the dime and taxpayer dime eventually it's not going to be able to sustain itself. That That's the definition of unsustainability. When you start having more people that are being pulled in the wagon than people that are pulling the wagon. You know, when you have so many people that are on the mooch compared to people that are actually doing the work. So anyway, these are, these are things that, uh, that I just like to bring up here. And also, um, I have one other topic that I'd like to mention here, and I, I thought this was amazing, and I went ahead and signed up for this. Uh, Rand Paul, he just released a class action lawsuit uh, against the NSA. I think this is amazing. I think everybody who's, um, who's interested in, in fighting for your rights and who's against the NSA, uh, they should definitely be paying attention to this. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, play a quick clip here, uh, and it's basically the interview from Rand Paul talking about this class action suit against the NSA. As promised, Kentucky Senator Rand Paul is here with an exclusive annou- announcements involving 
a major lawsuit against President Barack Obama. Senator, others have filed, but your class action lawsuit is the first of its kind, and this takes this to a whole new level. Tell us all about the lawsuit, sir. Well, the thing about it is, is the question here is whether or not constitutionally you can have a single warrant applied to millions of people. So we thought what better way to illustrate the point than having hundreds of thousands of Americans sign up for a class action suit. So about six months ago, we began this call. We now have several hundred thousand people who want to be part of this suit to say to the government and to the NSA, no, you can't have our records without our permission or without a warrant specific to an individual. So it's kind of an unusual class action suit in the sense that we think everybody in America who has a cell phone would be eligible for this class action suit. And if any of your viewers have a cell phone, they just have to go to my Facebook tonight and they can sign up to be part of the lawsuit. We want to overwhelm the government and we want to show publicly that hundreds of thousands of people don't uh, we object to the government looking at our records without our permission. And one of your lead lawyers is Ken Cuccinelli, is that right? Yeah, Ken Cuccinelli is the former attorney general for Virginia. He also was the first uh, attorney general to file a lawsuit against Obamacare. And he's joined our legal team. He has constitutional expertise. And uh, we're hoping with his help that we can get a hearing in court and ultimately get this uh, class action lawsuit, I think the first of its kind on a constitutional question, to take it all the way to the Supreme Court. And so, Senator, what exactly do you want to, the outcome from this lawsuit to, to be? What, what do you want the Obama administration to do? We want them to protect the Fourth Amendment. We want them to protect the right to privacy. We want them to understand that we're not willing to trade our liberty for security, that we think we can have security, that we can defend against terrorism, but that doesn't mean that every individual American has to give up their privacy. And we think we can have both, but we are very upset that this president doesn't seem to be too concerned with our right to privacy. So are you looking for the, the administration, President Obama specifically, to turn to the NSA and say, hey, um, be more diligent when you go to the FISA court to ask for the warrant? Is, is that what you're looking for? Yeah, well, you know, I've actually introduced legislation that would make it more specific. When the president goes to the FISA court and the FISA court issues a warrant for all of the cell phone records in the country, we want the cell phone provider to be able to appeal the FISA court, which is a secret ruling. We want them to be able to appeal that ruling into a public court, such as the Supreme Court, because we don't think a question of constitutionality should be decided in secret. Now, this sounds like, maybe sounds like a crazy question, but I'm, I'm very serious about this, Senator. Are you worried that you're being monitored by the NSA and other, uh, in other agencies? Uh, you know, I don't really think so, but I think that the potential for the abuse exists. Think about it in this context. We now have an administration that has used the IRS to go after people who are of conservative political bent or have certain religious beliefs. So they've already shown that they will use what is supposed to be impartial, the IRS, to do it. Uh, leads me to wonder and worry whether or not they would use the NSA that way. I have no proof that they have, but I am concerned that it could be abused. But I'm also concerned that it, even if a president isn't going to abuse a power, I am concerned that the president thinks he has the power to collect all our records. And when they came out of the White House with several congressional leaders about a month ago and they said, oh, we're not spying on Americans because they defined the collection of this data not to be spying, I am concerned that they're going to whitewash this and that he's going to say, oh, we have these reforms, we've looked internally and we have some new controls. Well, no, this has to be decided publicly by the Supreme Court. The president doesn't get to create the law, write the law, and decide and adjudicate it. This has to go before the Supreme Court. All right, Senator, let's play a soundbite from March uh, of 2013 with James Clapper testifying to a Senate, to a, I believe it was a Senate panel, Senator, a congressional panel. Listen to the soundbite. Does the NSA collect any type of data at all on millions or hundreds of millions of Americans? No, sir. It does not. Not wittingly. There are cases where they could in inadvertently, perhaps, uh, collect, but not, not wittingly. So given what we know now, that, that appears to be a false statement given to a Senate panel, that was Senator Wyden. Um, should he, should uh, James Clapper be prosecuted? Well, lying to Congress is a felony, and I don't think we can pick and choose the law. 
You've got all of these people, like James Clapper and other, beating the table and saying that we want to put uh, Edward Snowden in jail for life, and yet they don't want the law applied to themselves. No, the law has to be applied le equally, and that's one of the real tenets of American jurisprudence is you apply the, lie, law, the law equally. I frankly think it would be somewhat enlightening for James Clapper and Edward Snowden to share a prison cell, and then maybe we'd all learn a little bit from that. Hmm. Um, do, do you distinguish between the data mining of phone records, which would be who I called, how long I spent on the phone, and the, and the phone number of the, the, of the number I called, versus some of the bodies of these, the actual conversations we've had, and maybe even the same going for emails. Not only just who I email, but what I'm actually saying in the email. I think this is something we have to figure out and the courts have to decide. I am worried about metadata, people dumbing that down and saying it doesn't mean anything. For example, my visa bill, someone called that metadata, but if you look at my visa bill, you can tell whether I drink, whether I smoke, what magazines or books I read, whether I go to a doctor, what medicines I take, and they might just say, oh, that's metadata because it wasn't the content of an email. I am very concerned that those are private matters and that the government should only look at your visa bill or your phone bill if they have a warrant that ha is specific to you and says that they think that you have committed a crime, and then I think it would be appropriate. But without a warrant specific to an individual, I think it's, it's illegal and unconstitutional. All right, before we let you go, where, uh, just tell us again where we can learn more about the lawsuit, where they can sign up on your Facebook page. Uh, is there anywhere else you can do this? Yeah, if you go to my non-governmental Facebook page, you can sign up there. You can go to Randpac and sign up there as well. There are several different venues, but if you have a cell phone in America and you're unhappy about the government looking at your data, your records, or even possibly your content, go to my Facebook page and sign up because we'd love to have you be part of this class action lawsuit. And Senator, um, you, very quickly, you expect to uh, have several hundred thousand Americans sign up, is that right? We already have several hundred thousand, and hopefully with all your viewership tonight, we'll get a couple hundred thousand more. Very good. We'll leave it right there, Senator. Yeah. Thank you very much. Coming. That's pretty amazing. So they are filing the class action lawsuit against the NSA uh, basically for violations of the Fourth Amendment, where they're unjustly and without provocation, they are searching our, our records, they're data mining everything, and, and they're basically... Uh, collecting every human communication, uh, electronic human communication. So, and they're doing all this without warrants and without any kind of justification. And, they're, and now they're saying, oh, they're, they're doing it with a, a, it's an accident. You know, we don't mean to get all of your information. We just are getting your information because the, the way our qualifications to, to take your information and to spy on you are so low that we, you know, we're just getting everything and we're, we're sifting through it later. It's easier for us to find that needle in a haystack because they have these complicated and unique uh, algorithms that they're using to, to basically go through. And all this, you know, this is, this is my problem is that it's making everyone in America a suspect. It's making everyone in America, uh, you know, a, a possible threat. This, to me, is not what I, I thought our country was like. You know, it, it wouldn't bother me so much if I was in Russia. It wouldn't bother me so much if I was in, you know, China, because they are, they're not known as the freest country in the world. They're not known to have these freedoms. But we are. We're supposed to be the country with the, the morality, we, you know, we, we have our own moral compass that, that we actually guide ourselves on. Our government is, is not uh, our, our master. We are our government's master. But yet we find out that our information is being collected on a, a, about us behind our backs. Our government is operating in the shadows. Our government is forcing people through gag orders to keep quiet about this information. And all this is going on and being regulated through secret courts, the FISA court. Why is it that we can't put the light of day on this stuff? This is important information. These are violations of the Constitution and, more importantly, human rights. These rights don't just belong to American citizens. These belong to everyone. They're innate, inherent rights that we all possess just because we were born. And it's a violation of anyone's rights to, to spy on them without reason, without warrant. At least that's my opinion. And I, I think a lot of you may, may agree. 
I'd like to hear what you guys have to say. Give us a call. The telephone number is 619-924-0986, 619-924-0986, or you can email the show at onthemoveshow at gmail.com. Um, at this point, we're going to take a quick commercial break, and when we get back, we're going to have Dan Sandini of the Daylight Disinfectant. All right, thanks for sticking with us. Support On The Move. Help us make this podcast bigger and better. You can do this by going to our store and purchasing one of our hundreds of products. All designs are original and made for patriots like you. Just go to cafepress.com slash on the move show. We appreciate your support. Need design services? Logo design for $90, business cards, brochures, bumper stickers, signs, flyers, promotional products such as mugs, pins, bags, keychains, magnets, and so much more. Contact Latasha Worley for a quote on your next project at Tasha. T-O-S-H-A at lwhirleyphotography.com today or visit me on the web at lwhirleyphotography.com and on Facebook at facebook.com slash lwhirleyphotography and on Twitter at twitter.com slash Tasha Worley. Show your support for a designer who believes in the Constitution and your rights. All right, we're back. Like I said, today we have special guests Dan Sandini of the Daylight Disinfectant, who will be joining us on the show. Dan is an independent journalist, uh, citizen journalist, working out of Portland, Oregon. His never-take-no-for-an-answer approach to learning the truth behind government corruption has earned him national recognition on the Lars Larson Show, the Glenn Beck Program, The O'Reilly Factor, and Sean Hannity. He's been ca- compared to Andrew Breibart and James O'Keefe. His staunch, yeah, he is a staunch advocate for the First Amendment. He produced a video of the Orwellian experience, which has received almost 70,000 views on his YouTube channel. Following the 2010 Tax Day Tea Party, he produced videos detailing the hateful rhetoric and behavior of the left, including homophobia, racism, and anti-Americanism, and also threats of violence. Also, he's a friend of mine. We're very excited to have him on the show today. Are you there, Dan? I am here. Can you hear me, Max? I can hear you great. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on the show today. It's a great show. I've been listening. I appreciate that. So my very first question for you, sir, is what is going on in Oregon? There's a whole bunch of crazy stuff happening. I, I've, I've been hearing about uh, Governor Kitzhopper and all the corruption going on down there with him. And also, uh, I mean, apparently Senator Merkley is a global warming alarmist now. What's going on with that? Well, well um, if, you, if folks who are listening uh, from across the nation, we have our implementation of Obamacare here in Oregon, which is called Cover Oregon. And Cover Oregon was rated last, dead last, in the independent Alabair healthcare survey in terms of servicing their customers. Our website is still not operational here in Oregon, and we have yet to register online a single applicant. Now, they've put in place a paper process, which has thousands of applications from before the first of the year that they still have not provided people health insurance for. So there are people who were thrown off of their policies here in Oregon who do not yet have their health insurance cards in hand. And um, on, uh, on Thursday, it was not only the board meeting for Cover Oregon. So Cover Oregon is uh, independent for, uh, go- of the government, which is they, they work with the government, but it's not a government agency, so it's sort of this crazy thing here. But they had their board meeting, but also Governor Kitzhaber finally started giving interviews. And I believe it was Coyne that got the guy on the spot. It might have been K2. No, I think it's K2. Yeah, K2, which is one of the local television programs here, uh, mm-hmm. and finally got him to sit down for a few minutes on, on Cover Oregon. And uh, one of the um, uh, local politicians, Pat, uh, I think it's Pat Shee, he had sent emails to uh, Governor Kitzhaber over a year ago 
uh, letting them know of all the problems that they had, the fact that they had incompetence, the fact that Oracle was not doing their job, the fact that the government folks who were supervising these people who were implementing the website weren't doing their job, and it was ignored. It, he sent it to the email for Governor Kitzhaber's staff that usually received stuff from the local politicians. And, uh, yeah, it was Patrick Sheehan, I think is the guy's name. And, Pe and um, Patrick never got a response, and Kitzhaber is saying he never saw the email. So it's sort of one of these things that, uh, like the IRS scandal with uh, uh, Barack Obama and him mm -hmm. saying that he never saw the email. But they are actually going to have an independent investigation into what happened with Cover Oregon. And you may actually see Governor Kitzhaber caught up in a scandal. Like he's got enough scandals on his hands already. But, uh, mm -hmm. but yeah, so you're, you're finally seeing the mainstream media come around to placing the blame on Cover Oregon where it squarely lies. And that is right in the lap of Governor Kitzhaber. This has been his baby since day one. People here in Oregon know it. And it's a huge embarrassment to him because this is a great social experiment, right, Matt? Because this is uh, socialized medicine. Uh, and yeah. uh, its first, it's first uh, experiment here in, uh, here in Oregon is failing. It's failing. Yeah, and it's failing so bad that Cover Oregon is now being commonly referred to as Barry Oregon. Yeah, right. Barry, Oregon, so, or, I mean, I have uh, Cover Up, Oregon, I think, is Lars Larson. And, you know, if I could just say, the, the people who have been on top of this, you know, the mainstream media outlets like the Portland Tribune, the Oregonian, which if people don't know what the Oregonian is, if you're from Boston, it's like the Boston Globe, Portland. It's, uh, I call it the zero. I think Lars calls it the daily fish wrapper because that's about what it's good for, is wrapping fish and lining bird cages. And, yeah. uh, you know, these reporters from that newspaper – uh, Jeff Makes, who I ran into the other night, he's the political correspondent for that paper. They have been asleep on the job on this thing. And not only asleep, they have been helping to spin this thing in a positive way for the left. And it is an mm -hmm. utter disaster. And what, what I was, where I was going was is that, you know, the independent media was on top of this thing from the beginning. I have videos of uh, Governor Kitzhaber, who I confronted on Cover Oregon back in October and November up on my um, – uh, you can see those on my website, daylightdisinfectant.com, or go to my YouTube channel. Uh, YouTube forward slash daylight disinfectant, you will see me question the governor on these things. Back when people were, you know, looking at me like I was loony for trying to pin this on uh, on Kitzhaber, but this is exactly what's happened. This is a huge scandal that's going on here in Oregon. And um, mm -hmm. hopefully the right will be able to take advantage of that and uh, bring some sort of sanity back to politics here in Oregon. Absolutely. And, and I think it's important that we actually – put the blame and or credit. I mean, if things are working out, we, we, we label it as such, just like how Obamacare is his, his named, you know, a, a piece of legislation. I mean, why aren't we referring to this as kid topper care? So he gets the credit or blame that he deserves, you know. It, one thing that I also saw uh, on the same thing, I think it was a K2 news report uh, where he took an interview. They were asking him um, basically when the website will be fully functional. And Governor, K Governor Kitzhopper said, uh, I can't give you a date, but we're confident that we'll get it up and running. I can't give you a date because I don't have one. You, you know, this is the kind of stuff that is really blowing me away. It, it's already January. The stuff is supposed to be in full swing. It was supposed to be happening a long time ago. And we can't even get a website up and running that was we spent millions of dollars running you know not only the uh, the Oregon one but the the national one as well. It took we had all these glitches on these websites. This is my main thing, is that if we can't even trust them to put a website together functionally and actually manage it, how can we expect that they'll actually run our health care system properly? Well, you can't, it's, and it's not going to work. And this, you are looking at a disaster of extraordinary magnitude. And I can tell you why Governor Kitzhaber does not have a date for you. And, you know, no one's been listening. <laughs> I just say it, Matt. But I, I feel a little like Don Quixote some days. But I went to their meeting, uh, to the Cover Oregon board meeting back in November, and a lot of people don't know this, but I retired in, uh, let's see, 2005, 2006, 2005, uh, from the MITRE Corporation. I'm a software engineer with uh, 20, 20 years experience in information technology. I have a master's in software engineering. So I can sit there and listen to Aaron Karjala, who is, he's the CIO of Cover Oregon, and he also works for Oracle. Now, if you want to tell me there's no conflict of interest there, right? And I, mm -hmm. I, but, and I, I do want to get around to how it's not Oracle's fault, okay? not all Oracle's fault, okay? I do want to make that point here, that the responsibility for this is not only with the contractor. Well, I believe you have seen some incompetence here. 
which is surprising to me given what I had heard about Oracle before. I, I, I don't have any direct experience with people who work for the company, but I can tell you that their, their reputation is very good. These are very bright guys. But I, I, I have really tried, <coughs> excuse me, Matt, to uh, talk to these folks about what the problems that they have. So back in November, I went to their meeting. <coughs> excuse me. And, um, yeah, I, I um, listened to them talk about how they were going to save this website. And so Aaron Carjala was there, and Rocky King, who has since resigned, he, he resigned in shame. Okay, first he said it was a, uh, a, a, um, a medical leave of absence, and then he resigned in the second week, I think it was first or the second week of January here. Uh, so the executive director is gone, okay? Uh, he mm -hmm. sat there too, and I was listening to this, and they were saying that they were going to, um, and I don't know what your experience is in information technology, but, you know, we have certain things that, you know, I got my, my master's degree in software engineering. There's certain things that you remember, the back of the envelope type things. And one of them is a guy named Fred Brooks, who in the 70s wrote a classic paper in software engineering called The Mythical Man Month. Anyway, it's still, you can still buy a collection of his papers out on, uh, out on Amazon and read the paper for yourself. I think it's great. You can probably find it online, too, and read that paper, The Mythical Man Month because it's an axiom of software engineering. When a project gets behind, particularly one of these huge behemoth projects like Cover Oregon, mm -hmm. when it gets behind, adding more people to a late project makes it later. And I sat there and listened to the Oracle guys say they were going to throw 25, 30 more people on there. And that may not be obvious to your listeners or to you on why that is. Why is it that when you add more people to a late project, it makes it later? And that fact that, that just... It amazed Fred Brooks, and he was trying to figure that out, and he did figure it out. And the reason is, is because when you add more people in, it's not like you're producing cars on a Ford assembly line, okay? It, these people all have to talk to one another. You have to set them up accounts inside of a baseline environment. They have to learn how you manage that environment. There's a certain number of those people who are going to be totally useless, okay? And you're going to educate them. Their, their resumes look great, but they're not a help to you at all. So these people, that, and they have to be cared and fed, and fed as a part of your program. So as a project manager, all these new people coming into your project, you know, when, is when you least need it, what you need are your core people that are actually continuing to work on a set of baseline requirements. And so when I heard that, I was like, th these people are, are really on Planet X someplace. There's no way you are ever going to get a system, and I will still hold to that that with the baseline software that they have right now, they are going to have to junk, and they are going to have to come back and do it again. And now, Mac, and I can tell you more about that, they are starting, you are starting to hear, and, and, and this will be one of the first times, if there's somebody out there from Oregon that's listening to this, you won't hear this anyplace else, okay, because I've been watching the news stories, okay? The, what are they going to do? That's what you have to ask yourself. Well, if Oracle doesn't come through with this website, what's the next step? And they have begun to talk about that at the meeting that I was on on Thursday. And what, what, are, the, what are they saying as far as the next step? Is, is this the one? Because uh, I've seen some, some of your videos on this. Uh, I, I know they were talking about setting up um, different things for uh, people who can't speak English and uh, other stuff like that. What's the next step that you're referring to, though? Right, let's, let's drive more people to a website that doesn't exist, right, Mac? That makes a lot of sense, right? That, that, yeah. that came out at the meeting. But now, they, I don't have it up in the video yet. And it's funny, these videos, I, ha I put three of them together before I put up the one on these multicultural, uh, these multicultural fairs that they're going to run, which people can check that out. That video is at YouTube forward slash Jlight Disinfected. But what they're going to do, Mac, and that's not up any place yet, I've just been trying to figure out how do I get this information out to people in a way that's not so dry that you have to sit through a board meeting, okay? And I guess I should write a blog article on it, but I'm not a blogger, you know? But this is what they're going to do. You're yeah. hearing rumbles about them reusing another state's website software or reusing software from the federal government. And when you begin to talk about that, Mac, you're dead in the water, man. You're, the, all of the engineering that they've done, all of the coding, design, tests that they've done on this stuff already, there's no way you were going to take this at a late stage in the game. If you did not design in that you were going to use someone else's reusable components, 
It's toast. You're never going to be able to use that stuff with it. So, so they're going to have to start from scratch. It's going to be exactly what I told them back in November. Oh, man. They didn't listen to me back then. I gave testimony, by the way. You have not seen the Oregonian report that testimony. You have not seen any of the television stations report that testimony. That testimony is a part of a public record. It was recorded. It was broadcast live. I'm sure it appears in the transcripts. If people want to go back, the K2 guy gave me his um, gave me his business card after this meeting, and I, I got up there and repeated it again, Mac. I hate to get up there. You know, I'm supposed to be the citizen journalist, right? Well, I also happen to be a software engineer, okay? And so, I, you know, I hand somebody else my camera, and I get up there and give expert testimony. And the woman said for me, well, the woman at the, at the table, what, uh, what is her name? Ah, I can't. Christensen. Her last name is Christensen. She's one of the board members, okay? Mm -hmm. She looks at me and she says, well, you're just one person, okay? I said, how many other inputs did you get? Did you get conflicting inputs? She said, yes, we got conflicting inputs, but not from citizens, from people on the team. And, and I said, did you listen to those? And she said, yes. And I said, well, how's that working out for you? She didn't have a word to say after that because she knows they are in exactly the same place. As a matter of fact, it's worse, Mac. When I was there in November, okay, Aaron Karchala, the CIO for Cover Oregon, said that they were going to have uh, the first portion finished in early to mid-December. That's, uh, it's called the, not the qualification, but whether you actually qualify for a subsidy. And then the last part, the online shopping part, was going to be done at the end of December, okay? And now in the meeting in January, okay, so that's a month later, right? So that means they're, so that's from the 1st of October. That was all supposed to be ready. So that's October, November, and December. That's three months late. Okay, a month out, okay, they are still in the same place, worse than that. In January, they are saying they're not going to get it by the end of March, okay? So that means they are slipping a month for a month, okay? There's no sign of progress. That's another thing you look for as a software engineer is, okay, the milestones are moving out, okay? You're supposed to get a system by this day, but they're moving out by less. Do you follow what I'm saying? Instead of being mm -hmm. three months out, okay, now it's two months out, now it's one month out, okay, now you got it done. That's not what we're seeing. We're seeing that it's slipping more than a month for a month, which means yeah, you keep walking, you, you keep walking towards the wall, but you're never going to get there. You always go half the distance to the wall, and you're never going to get there. And and they are, and you know what? What is it? Uh, Albert Einstein, I think, said uh, one definition of insanity is continuing to do the same thing over and over again, <laughs> expecting a different result. Right? Yeah, they are doing yeah. the exact same thing. And I asked them for an apology. I said, for the, you know, you have had literally hundreds of thousands, okay, I said tens of thousands, but there's probably 200,000 people here in the state of Oregon, I think it's 180,000, that had their health insurance policies canceled because of Obamacare. But they said that people told them that they were going to be able to keep their policies, people like me, okay. My particular policy, in the last week of December, after I had made other arrangements, they told me that I could keep it for another three months. What good is that to me now? I've already given yeah. it up and, and found another policy, right? I asked these people for an apology. Not a single one of them would do that. Now, mm -hmm. the new executive director... Uh, I can't think of his name right now offhand. I have to look it up on my website, but it is there. He he um, uh, he did apologize to the K2 reporter afterwards. She put him on the spot after I did. Okay, oh, and wow. he did apologize. So you know, for what it's for what it's worth, it was kind of a weak apology. I guess I should put that up. I'll put that up on YouTube so people can see it. Anyway, we got a weak apology there. Anyway, anyway, yeah. I guess that's a video. And well, it just, after it you look at this, like, like good, they, they, they're unwilling to actually admit to their faults. You know, and, and I, I'm I'm going to go ahead and uh, correspond this with what we've been seeing in the news recently. You know, I, I don't support Governor Chris Christie, but at least with what he's been doing with the bridge apocalypse that's been going on over there, uh, he's. He, he actually took the time to actually admit that, you know, it, it was his responsibility, you know, and I, I don't support Governor Chris Christie, but, it, you know, this is the, the, the difference between the left-right paradigm, you know, at least uh, Republicans are willing to admit when, they, when somebody in their office or they have made a mistake, you know, if they've had a failure of management, that, you know, Chris Christie quickly, I mean, very quickly stepped up and said, yes, you know, th th I didn't have any knowledge about this. Whether or not you believe or, dis or disbelieve that, or it, you know, it doesn't matter. He admitted responsibility, which is something we don't see on the left. They are quick to shift blame, to lie, to create lies about their lies. It, it, they're not willing to actually stand up and, and admit when they've had a failure of, of leadership. Yep. You know, and that's very, it's a very big difference between the left and the right. And, you know, I knew Andrew Breitbart, and he was very quick to, to show the differentiation between the left and the right. And it's exactly what you said. 
if the if it had been the right that did something like this, you would take responsibility and eat crow to begin with, right? Okay, you may not may even resign over something a mess up of this ordinary. Think about this. This is the biggest change in our lifetimes. You know, I'm quite a bit older than you, Mac, 51 years old. Okay, in my lifetime, this is going to be one of the largest changes in our lives. The fact that we are going to socialize medicine. The fact that when you have a heart problem, okay, when you have arrhythmia or you get cancer, lymphoma, women get breast cancer, you are the, your treatment is going to be decided. What you get and what you don't get is going to be decided by a government agency. Think about that. The same Absolutely. people that have screwed up the post office, right, are going to be screwing that up. And yeah. so you have a, a mess up that big and no one taking responsibility for it, exactly what you're saying. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just, I just don't get the the blind confidence that we've been putting in our government recently. I, I, the, the expanding government to me, it, it doesn't make any sense. We see the post office failing. We see that the government, that they're not able to create wealth. They're, they don't know how. The only thing the government knows how to do is to consume wealth and to steal other people's property. That's it. The, those are the only two things that they're actually good at. It is to, it because they, they, they mismanage their organizations because they don't run like businesses. Businesses are pure profit. Businesses are are finely tuned. You know the, the, those things know how to make money because that's their job. That that's their livelihood. But the government they don't require money. That it, to, at least not to make it. They just take it. They take what they want. And, and one thing that, to keep in mind is that everything that the government has, they have stolen. You know, it, it didn't belong to them in the first place. They took it. it. They took it from somebody somewhere, and they mismanage all these programs. Anything that the government takes over, it's a guarantee that it's going to be mismanaged, and it's going to be worse than it ever was before. So why in the world would we put them in, in charge of our most valuable resource, our health? You know, it, it doesn't make any sense to me. It, it, this is something that could have been easily privatized even further, you know, it, it, to allow things to uh, be bought across state lines, you know, it, to lower, lower down the, the, um, uh, the prices basically by, you know, increasing demand. If, if all these companies and all these states are competing with each other, you know, across the entire country for, for people's business, it, I mean, it may put people out of business, but that's the free market. The, the prices will necessarily drop, and it will be better for the consumer overall. That's just the way the free market works. I think you're absolutely right. And, and you know, the founding fathers understood that there was very little that the government did well. And, you know, they, the, and the, really the only power they gave was for the government to control our military and to protect our borders and to fight our wars for us. And they do that extremely well. You know, I was lucky enough in my career to work with the military, and those guys will make stuff work no matter what, okay? Absolutely. And it's because it's between them and the bad guys. <laughs> you know, it's like, but in something like healthcare, it looks more like something like the post office. And, mm-hmm. you know, that's just a very, that sort of inefficiency. And I think the, one of the problems is, is that young people, you know, the left understands this, and a, a, most of the young people, have never faced a chronic illness, you know. They have never mm-hmm. faced, in, and then, even then, there's a much smaller portion, like myself, you know, I've been through cancer, I had lymphoma in 2004, 2005, and I'm a survivor, and I had that while I was in Germany. And mm-hmm. I got to look up close and personal, you know, there's a lot of experiences in my life that have really made me suitable for the job that I'm doing right now. And part of it was that experience in Germany and being on the inside of the German healthcare system. And I'm telling you that it is just a very scary thing when you need um, an MRI and you are told as a man in a lymphoma clinic, okay, to go over to the woman's clinic, the Frauen Hospital, you know, to, to get in line with the rest of the women for the one MRI machine that they have, okay, so they can do an MRI on you. And then, you know, once you get it and you get a diagnosis of cancer, and, you know, you've got, you know, one of the first things they do for you is biopsy. Okay, here in the States, a biopsy can be, a doctor can do it in his office, okay? It's that simple a procedure. In Germany, at, at first I was, I was told two weeks to wait for the biopsy, and I said, fine. And this, think about this scary phone call, Mac. So you're waiting for your biopsy. You're a young guy. Like, well, I was in my 40s, okay, but, you know, it's scary to me. You know, I've got cancer. I don't understand cancer. I know, you know, I'm in great That's shape. True. I've run marathons, you know. 
and someone calls you from the government, a government nurse calls you and says, hey, we were looking at the list of people who are waiting for a biopsy, and yours is scheduled for a couple of weeks. So instead of a couple of weeks, there are people who are more urgent than you. We're going we're gonna to move that out a couple of months. And I'm like, hey, who's your boss? There oh, is man. no boss. You know what I mean? That's it. That's the decision, you know? And that's what you're moving to in the States. Think about that. Think about the fact that you won't be able to get the life-saving medicine that you need because you have to get in line in, at the post office. And then you'll Absolutely. have a very close look at what Obamacare is going to be for you folks. Yeah, I, I just don't understand. Like, has anybody ever been to the DMV? Uh, have they enjoyed that experience? <laughs> I mean, that, that's what you're talking about turning our healthcare system into. Why in the world would you want to have that kind of customer service experience? It, it, it blows me away. But, you know, I think one benefit of this situation is that the left is actually turning their uh, – one of their biggest supporting bases, uh, the, the young people in America, you know, the college-age students, uh, into – you know, some of their harshest critics and, and, you know, political enemies in this situation because they, they are dependent on these people. You know, people my age, I'm 28 years old, you know, it, they're dependent on us to actually buy into this program so that we can subsidize the, the, the people who aren't going to pay for this. But, I, I mean, it, it doesn't make sense for us to, to do that. Unless you have a, a pre-existing condition or something, you know, it, you might as well just wait until you're sick and then get on this program in the open enrollment period. And, and I think that we're going to see this happening, and this program is just going to end up, you know, being, uh, you know, collapsing underneath its own weight, which is what a lot of these Republicans originally wanted to do during the whole defund Obamacare thing. Yeah, but I think, I, Mac, I really don't know where it ends. I, I don't know what the end game looks like because there's no way they're going to let it go under at this point. Oh, yeah. So what they're, and it's, you're absolutely right. It, the model is economically unfeasible, right? My, you know, mm -hmm. my, my friends who are in their 20s, none of them are buying this thing. You know, they look at it. It's like, okay, I'm going to buy this. I have a $6,000 deductible. I'm going to pay a couple hundred dollars a month for this thing. It's never going to pay me anything. I don't yeah. have to buy it. And even if I break the tax law, right, the first year, it's going to cost me $90. Big yeah. deal. If I get sick, they can't turn me down. You know, it's, so they're all, they're all, I'm not going to buy this crap, right? And, yeah. and it's true. It's, there's no money coming in the door from the folks like me. When I started working for minor, you know, I started paying on my health insurance immediately when I went there. I think it was like 30 70 or something like that. Minor paid 70 I paid 30%. And I never went to the doctor, for God's sakes. You know, it was like I was probably in my 30s before I walked through the door, you know, yeah. said, hey, you know, I've got a problem. And, and it, I was just a healthy individual like most of us are. So paying into the system over the years, you know, you, you actually help them run a profit so that they can service some of the older people, just as you say. But now what you've done is you've said to these people, hey, don't bother. You know, <laughs> yeah. You know, and and uh, so what they're going to end up doing is what they're doing for everything else. Which, sad as it may seem, I think that what they're going to end up doing, Mac, is they're going they're going to print money to do it. You know, you will uh, just yeah. see them floating more and more bonds, and the debt will the debt will rise, and eventually you'll hit the tipping point. And you know, I don't. Mm -hmm. My personal opinion on what that looks like in America is Argentina. That you know, you are eventually. That's the problem with inflation. You also have an MBA, and I studied a lot of finance, and what mm -hmm. eventually happens is inflation, and I'm also old enough to have seen the Carter years, and what eventually happens is it reaches a tipping point, okay? And there are just so many dollars out there chasing the same amount of goods. Nobody's working, but everybody's got money, okay? Yeah. And, <laughs> and so in that economy, prices just start to, and you're seeing it at the supermarkets now, you know, you see these products. They have artificial numbers so that they can show low numbers on the CPI, and they've just been changing that game so that they can keep the number low, but you can't do yeah. that forever, okay? And eventually, eventually, prices are, you know, you're going to see hyperinflation, superinflation, and uh, mm -hmm. that's, that's going to be, you know, that's really going to be a bad scene because you won't be able to, I, I don't know if your listeners know the history of what happened in Argentina. It wasn't that long ago. You can't run the printing presses fast enough, and you can't print enough money to buy the paper that's necessary to print the money. Money was literally not worth the paper they were printing it on. But, and Absolutely. that's what will eventually happen. You'll see a I period mean, of hyperinflation in the United States. Yeah, the, the same and, thing uh, happened in, in Germany after World War II. The, they, the banks basically just emptied out their vaults and threw the money out in the streets. Kids were building pyramids with this, with this money that was not worth anything. <laughs> 
but but I mean, you know, at, at some point, and I agree, we're we're continuing to see the in, the the you know the the value of the U.S. dollar being you know lowered and lowered, and it's being worth less and less. And eventually, you know, if if we continue to print this money, and Obamacare looks like it, it's going to be one of those systems that we just have to keep printing money, 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 and into this to to keep it afloat. You know, we devalue the dollar. Eventually, it's going to go from being worth less and less and less to being worthless and not worth anything. It's not going to be worth the paper it's printed on, like you said. But, uh, hey, I, I'm really enjoying this conversation with you, Dan. Uh, i got to take a quick break. Would you mind uh, sticking around for that? I'd love to be. My pleasure, man. All right. I'll be right back. Thank you. Support On The Move. Help us make this podcast bigger and better. You can do this by going to our store and purchasing one of our hundreds of products. All designs are original and made for patriots like you. Just go to cafepress.com slash on the move show. We appreciate your support. Need design services? Logo design for $90, business cards, brochures, bumper stickers, signs, flyers, promotional products such as mugs, pins, bags, keychains, magnets, and so much more. Contact Latasha Worley for a quote on your next project at Tasha, T-O-S-H-A, at lworleyphotography.com today. Or visit me on the web at lworleyphotography.com. And on Facebook at facebook.com slash lworleyphotography. And on Twitter at twitter.com slash Tasha Worley. Show your support for a designer who believes in the Constitution and your rights. And we're back. When we left, we were on the phone with Dan Sandini of the Daylight Disinfectant at uh, daylightdisinfectant.com. And uh, we were talking about uh, Barry, Oregon, otherwise known as Cover, Oregon, Obamacare, and the effects that uh, this is having on the economy. Um, if you would like to join the conversation, the telephone number is 619-924-0986. Again, that's 619-924-0986. Or you can email the show at onthemoveshow at gmail.com. And feel free to ask either myself or Dan any questions you may or may not have. All right, Dan, are you there? I am. I'm still here, Max. How are you doing? All right. I'm doing good. Uh, one thing I'd like to, to mention here is uh, the global warming video that you put out uh, about Senator Merkley. Apparently, he's uh, joined the ranks of the uh, global warming alarmists, talking about how it's basically it's, it's a real thing, first of all. But secondly... Uh, you know, all, all the things that he supports as far as restricting businesses and, and the carbon tax and all these additional uh, government programs that he's using to, or that he wants to use to basically rein in people using and producing carbon. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on this? Well, I, I think that uh, global warming is exactly in the same vein as Obamacare, and the, the two things can be compared to one another, uh, you know, side by side. And what's happening here, in talking about Obamacare, it's like I, th I think no matter how you and I just looked at the scenario for what's coming for Obamacare, it is a disaster, okay, it really. You see a breakdown of the health care system and a breakdown of the economy. But why are people doing that? And then the answer is, is that you have – and the answer is greed. And it's not greed in the traditional sense that people think about it as, which is greedy capitalists. It's greedy, power-hungry politicians, okay, who mm -hmm. want to run everything, who believe that they are smarter than everyone else. You know, the founding fathers knew and believed that the individual was where the true power came, where the least amount of suffering in a lifetime came, the maximum amount of wealth came, okay, and they believed mm -hmm. in the power of the individual. Leftist politicians, statists, um, as Mark Levine would call them, okay, yeah. believe that they are smarter than everybody else, okay, and that's exactly what you're seeing with Obamacare and, uh, and global warming, too. They want to put in place a carbon tax, okay, so what touches every aspect of our lives, right, Healthcare. Everybody eventually needs to go see the doctor, okay? So what yeah. they want to do is they want to put, your, put themselves there. What, what global warming is, it's like, why, okay, so why would anyone create false alarmism like you're seeing Senator Merkley do, okay? And it's pretty clear. If you look at my website, daylightdisinfectant.com, I think the last story or one of the last two stories right up at the top of the page you're going to see is uh, Gordon Fultz take apart his argument. And, and he is just feeding that sort of alarmism here in Oregon. Okay, and he does it at his town halls. 
And the reason why they're doing that is they want to put in place a carbon tax. And so they will be able to regulate and meter basically every segment of the economy. So, you know, if you want to get less of something, tax it, okay? So they'll be able to turn the dials through the Department of Energy. They'll be able to turn the dials without going through Congress, which says in the Constitution they should, to be able to de-incentivize or re-incentivize any aspect of the economy that they want to do. And that's exactly how they're going to control the masses, is they are mm -hmm. going to do that through your, through your electric meter, okay? They're going to say, hey, guess what? If uh, you try and use this much power at this much time of day, it's going to cost you twice as much. And if you try and use power at peak times, we're going to shut down your air conditioner. That is coming to America right now, but people don't realize that. And it's based upon a false alarmism, okay? And, that false, and the penalty that you really pay here is progress. What you are stopping is progress, you know? Uh, machines that run off cheap energy are what fuel the economy of the world. That's what creates wealth in this world right now, okay? Absolutely. And the more you tax it, the less of it you're going to get. And that's what's going on right now. And, and Merkley is just, if you look at that video at DailyDisinfectant.com, you will see someone stand up and ask a question about, in, the, in, the, uh, in his town hall, about uh, global warming. And Merkley will parrot back the fact that, you know, what is it, anthropomorphic? I think that's the word. I'm not a, I'm not a, an, uh, I am not an environmentalist, but I think it's <laughs> anthropogenic, anthropogenic, I think it is, uh, yeah, global sure. warming, which is man-made global warming. And right now, we're experiencing a period of cooling, okay, and, mm -hmm. and, if, and even at periods that we were, okay, if you really look at the history of it, there's a, there's a, um, there's a great video called The Great Global Warming Scandal. It's out on YouTube. You can watch that. It's a BBC production. And it goes through it piece by piece on how what you're seeing is the natural solar cycles that are happening, that we don't have a damn, we don't make a damn bit of difference, that there is no linkage between uh, these, uh, these, car these uh, fossil fuel gases and the warming that you're seeing inside the planet. Well, well, wait a, and, wait a and, second, Dan. Uh, ho hold on. You're telling me that the sun affects climate? Crazy because as it sounds, the, right? The the UN they they said that the sun has absolutely no effect on climate. That they just they just <laughs> decreed that recently. The UN tells us that the sun absolutely does not affect the climate. So you're telling me that they're wrong? This is crazy. <laughs> You've just shattered yeah, my universe. I, you, you know, yeah, one, one thing about these people in in Obama, it, that he has said that energy prices are necessarily going to skyrocket. That that was what he said back. I think it was back in 2008. Uh, he was talking about how the, the uh, cap and trade, it would cause the, the energy pri prices to necessarily skyrocket. And, and it's all part of this carbon tax, a global warming, where they're trying to discourage everything. And, and, you know, in my opinion, this is all, it, like you said, I mean, I totally agree with what you said. This is all really hurting progress. The, it, I feel like we're entering the next modern, like, dark ages. It, it, it's, it, it's the new dark age. It's the, the dark ages part two because – uh, we have these people that are saying that, that, you know, they're progressives. They're the ones that are trying to make us, you know, progress through history. But, you know, it, they keep changing their names, for one. Uh, let me just point out that uh, progressives, they're all in line with socialist, communist kind of uh, policies. They used to call themselves, you know, Democrats, and they used to call themselves liberals. Now they're calling themselves progressives, and it's all this way of basically tricking people that, into not really knowing who they are or what they support. If, if you call them like they are, they are socialists. They believe in big government. They believe in the government having a hand in everything. They believe in the government being able to tell you how you can live your, your life. And like you said, they think that they're smarter than you. They think they know what's best. And because they know what's best and you're just too stupid to make up your own decisions, they can tell you what you can eat, you know, how you can live your life, the kind of house you can live in, the, the kind of car you can drive, what kind of health care you need. And, you know, it, they, they start influencing more and more in your lives. And we, we as a society, in, in my personal opinion, have become really cozy in living in this state of tyranny, this soft tyranny that we have right now. It, it's just, I, I don't know, it, it's blowing, blowing me away. I really don't think that our founding fathers would have supported what's going on right now. What do you think? No, I think, it's, I think they would be hanging their head in shame. 
but how did they do it? You know, well, how did we get to this place we are right now? And how did they convince the people into letting them do it? And each day, right, you're absolutely, you're absolutely right on it, Mac, is each day they're telling you what kind of car you can drive, what kind of car you can't drive. Then the next thing is when you can run your dishwasher, when you can't. And then when you can go to the doctor and which doctor you can go to, okay? But people, it's like the frog in the pot, right, where you slowly turn up the heat, right? It's day by day. Inch by inch, this has grown. And the other way, they've done it slowly, okay, and the other way that they've done it is through the school systems. You know, they have infiltrated the schools. Here in Portland, we have something called the Bus Project, and I don't know if you know about the Bus Project, Mac. Do you know what that is here in Portland? No, I don't know what that is. Okay, Okay, so Jefferson Smith, who uh, ran for mayor and lost, uh, we did a lot of nice coverage of, uh, of Jefferson Smith. I'm sure he thanks us for uh, our positive coverage of him. But he started something back around, uh, I think it was the year 2000, actually, here in Portland. I was not here, called the Bus Project. And uh, what it is is they, it's actually three non-for-profits, so they can walk a very cozy line in terms of the kinds of activities that they do. But they go into the schools here in Portland, okay, under the auspices of teaching um, civic duties to the kids, okay? And what, what they do is they, you know, they sign them up to vote while they're there, okay? So they, you know, that, that's part of this one of their uh, 401c3s, okay, does that. So they'll have young, cool people with piercings and they're dressed cool and whatever go into the schools during the school days, during the civics classes, sign the kids up to vote and say, oh, by the way, while you're there, you can come on one of these civic duty days that we have, okay? And so the kids sign up their names, so they build a contact list while they're there, okay? The kids' names, email addresses, cell phone numbers. So they've got this, this list. And, I know, and Henry knows I know how this works now. Okay, Henry Kramer, he used to be, I think he used to be the political czar. I forget what they call him now, the boss project, but he's still, he's still there. And what they'll do is they'll call these kids up on a Saturday and say, hey, it's civic duty day. Do you want to come on down? Say, oh, yeah, I remember those cool people who came into our, uh, our civics class. And some of the civics classes, they, it at least happened once because uh, the school had to, had to apologize for what they did. But what, ha- what happened basically, and Victoria Taft covered this on her show. By the way, Victoria, who is no longer on the air here in Portland, she was an immense treasure in this town. But she, she has covered that inside and out, if you want to go back to any of her old transcripts or whatever. But what they did was, and they continue to do it, okay, is so the civics teachers say, hey, guess what? You need to do your civic duty. So here's a number of ways that you can do that, one of which is to sign up for the bus project. Well, they're there, hey, I'm going to sign up for the bus project. And what it is is they show up at the school with a big bus on Saturday. They feed the kids, okay, and they say, hey, yeah, you guys all sign up to vote. So they have a leftist politician like John Kitts Harbor come in and feed them this status stuff into their young minds on a Saturday with all these cool people around them. And it's like, hey, let's all get on the bus. We're going to go and sign up people door to door to register them to vote. And, and this is the thing, if you want to, you can pass out information on these candidates. And oh, man. what great things these candidates are doing. They're all for equality and social justice, which is another code word, right, for communism and statism, okay? And so they are gathering together. Portlanders, if you don't know this, they are gathering together groups of your students from your schools on Saturday mornings and have them go, what I call it, what Victoria called it, is doorbelling for Democrats. They will go door to door. So they have infiltrated, they're not satisfied at the college level, which we can get into as well, which I've covered on my YouTube channel extensively with the International Socialist Organization. They are no longer satisfied. They have pushed that into the high schools, and they're going. They're trying to go even further than that, Matt. But right now you have the status. Well, you know, you, you were looking around for the word for it. Mark Levine calls it in his book, Statism, Progressivism, written right on the side of the book, right on the side of the bus project is Progressivism. That's what, that's crazy. And, that's, and that's what Jefferson Smith, who ran for mayor, he almost got to be mayor. Can you imagine what that would have been in our schools if that guy had won for mayor? I'm like, geez, I'm really glad Charlie, and Charlie Hales has done a lot of good. There's another thing I'll say while we get some airtime is Charlie Hales, if somebody says that they listen to the show tonight, here's an attaboy, man. 
this guy has cleaned up the city somewhat. Okay, I, I actually went on my run past City Hall the other day, and I didn't see a single gum wrapper. I didn't see a single thing on the street. No homeless people, no crap on the wow. streets. He has cleaned up Chapman and Lawnsdale Squares where uh, Occupy was. This guy has mm -hmm. re not only he has put up a not welcome here to the bums and the people who destroyed our city while Sam Adams was mayor, the people who ran roughshod over this city, Occupy, okay? And we can get into that as well, Mac. But, uh, but yeah, here's, a, here's an attaboy for Charlie Hales. It's, it's great that he won. Jefferson Smith did not win, lost that election. And so they did suffer a setback there, but the bus project that he runs is still active in terms of putting socialism, statism, progressivism into the high schools here in Portland, into the civics classes to begin indoctrinating and brainwashing these kids from a very early age. And conservatives, hey, man, we got to wake up. We have to wake up and we have to stop this stuff and we have to combat it ourselves. We need to Absolutely. be there in the schools as well. Yep, we need to Absolutely. be there in the schools as well. You, you know, one thing I'd like to point out is a lot of conservatives, I feel, are, are asleep when it comes to local politics. They, they, they pay more attention to, uh, you know, national politics. They, they're, they're really focused on, you know, what's going on in the office of the presidency, but they're not too concerned on getting active in their actual local community. And, and what you're talking about right now, the indoctrination of our children in high school, which, it, which I'll get to in a second, but uh, what you're talking about is showing the importance of of, a, of having a mayor, uh, you know, that, that a good mayor, how, how different they can create an outcome of the city. You know, just that mayor being in office, he changed the way that city was operating. And and, and you see how Governor Kitzhopper and, and his ilk are out there basically using these, uh, these useful idiots, as uh, Karl Marx, the founder of communism, called people who are basically blindly supporting the communistic socialistic policies without really understanding what's going into it. They're useful idiots. Uh, you know, it, it's it's a difference of a good uh, of a good person in office and a bad person in office. And I'm not saying that either one of them are bad or good people, but I'm just saying their politics uh, are corrupt and uncorrupt in different ways. So this just goes to show you, though. But as far as the indoctrination or, in our, of our children, you know, this is mind blowing to me that that we're not doing anything about this. You know, we have a, we have a uh, organization. You know, a nonprofit organization that's infiltrating our schools, which are on the government budget, basically, and they're using our children. Uh, they're using this to create lists to, to get our children on their time off of school. They, they're, this is a really gray area that they're operating under, and they, I'm sure they know it's shady, which is why they're doing it that way. Oh, they but they're know. using it to they basically. Know. Yeah, <laughs> I'm just. Well, they're using it to indoctr indoctrinate our children. You know, what'd you say? Yep, uh, it's a, that's exactly. That's exactly what they are doing. It's an indoctrination machine. But hey, uh, when I went to my first bus, that's how I got involved in citizen journalism, by the way. You know, people say, hey, what is a citizen journalist? Anyway, you know, it's somebody who looks at something and says, hey, you know, I can do that. I can take a camera. I can get out of that event. And I did. I went down to a bus project event. When I saw it, that was my baptism. Okay, this was 2010, shortly after the two, sh sh uh, I th actually 2009, right after the 2008 election. And, you know, I saw what was going down at, Gr at Grant High School that day. It was just amazing to me that this was actually happening at a high school because I knew the stuff the bus project taught. And I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. And so when they picked up the kids and put them in a bus, um, they took them up uh, to uh, the park up in Hillsborough. I'm trying to think of the name of it. Uh, Shoot Park is the name of the park. And I'm going to think of the name of the head of the AFL, their speaker for the day up at the park. Can you imagine your kids doing this? I'm going to do my civics class requirement this week. I'm going to get on the bus. I'm going to head up to Shoot Park in Hillsborough. They're going to bust me out from the inner city. See, this is how they do it. What they do, Mac, is they target. They will take um, districts that are borderline, okay? So all the, all the districts downtown are sewn up, right, as you can imagine. There's less mm -hmm. you can't. You cannot sit down down where I live in downtown Portland without sitting on a communist. I mean, it's just, you know what I mean? They're <laughs> everywhere. But yeah, yeah. it's of no use. It's like, it's like okay, so we've got more than we need down here, okay? We're, you know, nobody has a chance of ever winning down here, okay? So yeah. what we will do is we will take that core group of people and beliefs, okay, in the inner cities, and we will bus it out to these marginal districts. And we'll yep. use that indoctrinated labor force, free indoctrinated labor force, to go door to door for Democrats 
out in these marginal areas, and they'll pick up. They they actually did. Ben Unger just beat uh, Katie Iyer out in Hillsboro. Okay, and that's exactly the bus project was. Uh, well, ben Unger comes out of the bus project. Okay, that's exactly how they did that. I I know that that helps steer that election. Okay, Absolutely. by those guys going door to door and do that. And so you say to yourself, you know, okay, so who was their speaker that day when they went out? So they have a speaker. They have a barbecue. Max, they have a barbecue when they take these kids out in the summertime. The good weather is coming, so the bus project will be firing up here any day. Okay? Mm-hmm. They, they, they bring them out to Shoot Park. They have a barbecue. The speaker is the head. I can't think of his name right now, but, but he's the head of the AFL-CIO here in Oregon. That's the guy who gives the speech to your kids for, the, for their civic requirement for the day. Can you imagine that? Rather than hearing, a, you know, I don't know, someone talk about Abraham Lincoln or Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, you know, people who are all about individual freedom and preserving our liberties and that kind of thing. And instead of that, we've got the AFL-CIO who is actually doing the, doing the speech. And it was just amazing. And you should have heard him blaming Bush for everything. I mean, it was, yeah. it was incredible to me to see – and your kids don't have an alternative. They're just sitting there lapping yep. that stuff up. You know, it's it's very creepy. You know, people say, you know, I, you said in your intro for me, it's Orwellian. What is going on all around us right now is Orwell is Orwellian. And I can tell you from a number of different perspectives. And we should talk about the the, the actual police being used to shut down the independent media here in Portland. We should we should talk about that. Uh, but the, it is getting very. That's their weapon. You know, how do they fight against guys like you and me, Mac? They do. They have their weapons, and they're going to. They're they're ramping that up. They're definitely ramping that up. Absolutely. You know, uh, alternative media bloggers, citizen journalists, they've all been targeted recently. Uh, you look at the even something nationally here. Uh, Gr- uh, Glenn Greenwald, uh, the person who the reporter who leaked the Edward Snowden story. Um, you know how how he's been treated. He's been threatened to be prosecuted, and uh, you know they, they're trying to basically you know arrest him for reporting classified information. Well, it's not as a reporter, and I'm sure you know this as a reporter. It's not your obligation to uh, to keep classified information secret because. It's the person who leaked that information. There's laws in the books for that. They have a, a First Amendment protection, freedom of the press, to release that information, and they also have uh, a right to keep their uh, their um, their leakers basically confident. And you know, we, we even see uh, situations like uh, Julian Assange, Assange, the uh, the guy who is responsible for WikiLeaks. He he's had to flee the country. He's he's living down in South America now, afraid to step foot outside the embassy because if he does. He's afraid he's going to get assassinated by somebody. So, uh, you know, I, I mean, that, that's like a big scale kind of stuff. But, you know, we see, uh, you know, James O'Keefe, uh, you know, and, and other, uh, oh, yeah. you know, uh, other people even look at like Adam Kokesh. You know, uh, the citizen journalisms are under attack. And I'm not saying I necessarily agree with everything that everybody is out there doing. But uh, I, I do think that we all fall underneath the First Amendment freedom of the press. It, you know, just because I'm not with Fox News or I'm not with, you know, CNN, that doesn't mean that I, I'm not a member of the press. I'm a citizen journalism uh, journalist, and, you know, I'm, I'm trying to dig up the answers to keep these, these politicians honest, you know. And, and I can't trust these, these companies to – because that's what these, these big, uh, you know, actual companies, news companies are. They're, they're businesses, and they're owned by somebody, and that somebody may have a political agenda. So I can't trust them to actually report the real news and keep things honest because I don't know what their agenda is. I'm trying to figure it out. So, and I know that's what you were, you're out there doing, and I really appreciate you out there. Well, thanks very much for saying that. And how am I able to do that? I mean, and here's the thing is that I'm, I've been lucky enough, okay? I've worked really hard, and I'm here to say the American dream works, okay? I'm a guy who came from nothing out of a small town in Massachusetts, and just by living beneath my means and saving and investing the rest, I was able to retire at a very early age. So I'm in a lucky position where I don't need a paycheck, and I don't report to anybody. I have taken money for my videos before, but I don't need to. It gives me a little camera money and a little card money and that kind of stuff. And I get money off my YouTube channel. It's not much, but it's enough to help pay a little bit for what I do. But I don't need money from what I'm doing, okay? Mm -hmm. And so I'm lucky in that regard that I am beholden to nobody. And people who know me who, because I came out of the Tea Party movement, believe me, you know, Tea Party, and I'll, be, I'll talk like uh, Bill Post does, okay, and I think he's dead on with this. Bill Post runs a Bill Post radio show. It's the biggest transmitter, transmitter between Portland and uh, Northern California. And 
what you know what Bill has had to say is I believe in the Tea Party. Sure, small T, small P. Because what happened here around in Portland is you had the Oregon Tea Party, which was taken over by basically a corporation. And if you haven't seen the newspaper articles on John Kuzminich, just Google it up. Okay, just Google mm -hmm. up what Willamette Week has had to say. And this is just terrible that a movement as powerful as the Tea Party movement here in Portland was taken over basically by a corporate organization. And you know, so that the thing is, is that. The only people you can trust are the citizen journalists that are out there. They're the, they're the moms from the Tea Party, okay, who have given me videos before. You know, uh, a really good friend of ours, uh, you know, I hope I'm not talking out of turn here, but Rena, she, you know, Rena was a mom in the Tea Party who actually gave me a video that she took. She didn't want to have anything to do with it. But this woman was brave, brave enough to walk up to some of these vile just hateful individuals that came down to one of our tea parties to protest it, okay, that were yelling homophobic things, they were yelling racist things at black people in the tea party, and she took this video of these people yelling racist stuff at, at folks in the tea party, and that thing made it on to Glenn Beck, it was on the O'Reilly Factor, it was on Sean Hannity, and, you know, she was just, you know, she's just a, an average, everyday citizen. And, you know, for folks who are out there listening, that want to make a difference. You know, you're at home and you're thinking, okay, I'm listening to these guys ranting away. What can I do about it? <laughs> and what can you do about it? You can help get the truth out. You know, get everybody Absolutely. has a cell phone. Everybody has a camera now. Okay, everybody has a cell phone and a camera right now, and starting a YouTube channel. And now the software programs even automatically upload to YouTube. You don't even have to edit your videos anymore. You don't even have to take them off your phone anymore. I mean, when I first started this. It was really, it, it, there was an element of nuclear science to the thing back then. You know, we were home hobbyists, and now it's turnkey. It's so easy to be a video journalist. It's so much less focused on the technology and more focused on the content now. And what you need to be able to learn is to make yourself understandable and make yourself something that's enjoyable and entertaining to listen to. That's much more of the game of citizen journalism now than it is actually the technology. So each and every one of us, and the founding fathers, I mean, and use it or lose it, people, they gave each of you a fundamental right, something that will be taken away from you and is, be ta is being taken away from you right now, okay? And unless you use it, you will lose it. And that is your First Amendment right to the freedom of the press. We are all Thomas Paines, okay? We are the Thomas Paines of our time. And it's like cockroaches, okay? If, you can't, if there's that many of us out there, they can't stamp us all up. They can try, okay? But they can't stamp us all up. I'm sorry about that. That's my phone. Uh, no problem. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, that's me uh, talking. You... That's me. That's the dance talking too long and too passionately alarm. So anyway, but yeah, <laughs> use it or lose it on your First Amendment right. And uh, yeah, that's what you're doing, Mac, and that's what I'm doing. So I'm glad to be a part of that process with you. Uh, well, I, you know, I really, really appreciate the stuff that you've been doing. I, I've been following you for a while, and, and, you know, one thing I'd like to point out to, to listeners here is that, uh, you know, you and I, we initially bumped into each other at the uh, the Pack and Heat meet and greet down in uh, Vancouver, and um, we uh, we also bumped into each other again at the light rail protest in uh, in Vancouver, and you know, we exchanged information, and we got in contact from there. Um, I also saw that you were at the uh, memorial service for PFC Cody Patterson as well. Um, I saw you did a video on that. Um, hmm. it, it, I, I'm not sure what that was. I, I'm not, oh, I don't sorry, think that ahead. one was mine, Mac. So it might, it might have been somebody else's. That one's not mine. Oh, okay. I thought that was on your uh, Oh, yes, that was. That was that, oh, down in, that, that's absolutely correct. Yep, down in, uh, down in Corvallis. I was there. Yeah. That's right. I was thinking, yeah, I, out. yep. Yep, yeah, I got a video on that as well. The support. Yep, it, I didn't even get the big video. Yeah. Laughing at liberals got the big video, but I did have a small video on that. You're correct. I was trying to think. Did I put up a video on that? I did. I put up a small one live from the event, and it did. It got it got a few hundred views. Yep. Yeah, that, that and you know, I, I put up a, another video on that as well. And you know, the support for that event was crazy. There was like thousands of people out there supporting this guy. And, and you know, one of the reasons why I'm guessing that so many people came out was because there was that that church that was uh, the Baptist church that's. Uh, pretty far out there, uh, and they were going to. They, they threatened to come there and protest the uh, the, the funeral, the memorial. Yeah, Westboro Baptist. Yep, the Westboro yeah. Baptist. We're going to come down. Yeah. 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 So, they didn't show. 
But, but yeah, I, I, you know, I showed up, and they, they ended up not showing up. But, you know, one thing that kind of disappoints me is that, you know, it takes something like that for everybody to show up and, and to show their support. Because, you know, these men and women, they, they, they're they basically writing a blank check. You know, anything can happen when they when they decide to sign on the dotted line to become, uh, you know, a member of our military. And, you know, I, I was down there with the Oath Keepers uh, to show support for Cody. And, you know, I... Like I said, you and I keep we keep running into each other, and you know I, I really appreciate the stuff you're doing. And like you said, you know people need to get out there and and, and, and first of all, don't trust me. You know, don't trust anybody. No. Don't take, trust news organizations. Don't trust anybody. Do your own research. Be your own advocate. Be your own citizen journalist because the truth is out there. And you know it take it will take all of us to find out what's going on and become this basically a patriot wave uh tsunami uh you know to to hold these these people accountable we're in a constitutional republic and it's up to us to hold our our uh leaders feet to the fire in this situation so uh but anyway at, at this point i got to take another quick break uh do you have time to stick around I, i'm really enjoying talking sure I'll, 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 I'll stay with you one more segment mac how's that okay great i really appreciate it all right we'll be back in about a minute 30 on the move help us make this podcast bigger and better you can do this by going to our store and purchasing one of our hundreds of products all designs are original and made for patriots like you just go to cafepress.com slash on the move show we appreciate your support need design services logo design for ninety dollars business cards brochures bumper stickers signs flyers promotional products such as mugs pins bags keychains, magnets, and so much more. Contact Latasha Worley for a quote on your next project at Tasha, T-O-S-H-A, at lworleyphotography.com today. Or visit me on the web at lworleyphotography.com. And on Facebook at facebook.com slash lworleyphotography. And on Twitter at twitter.com slash Tasha Worley. Show your support for a designer who believes in the Constitution and your rights. And we're back. When we last left, we were talking with Dan Sandini of the Daylight Disinfectant from DaylightDisinfectant.com. If you'd like to join the conversation, the telephone number to, to, to call into the show is 619-924-0986. Again, that's 619-924-0986. Or you can email the show at On The Move Show, and I will read your emails live on the air. Okay, Dan, are you there? I'm in here, Matt. All right. So uh, one question I have for you, it, you know, I, I know we, we got into a little bit of your background on how you got into politics, um, but what specifically made you pick up the camera to become a citizen journalist? What motivated you to do that? Yeah, it was an interesting, uh, it, it's an interesting story, and it, and it, it um, perpetuated itself throughout my experience with the citizen journalism thing, but it was after the 2008 election and Obama had gotten in, and I was frustrated like most people. And I, I really had not, honestly, I was a conservative from way back from Reagan, but I really hadn't paid too much about politics. And I was like, wow, who is this guy, Barack Obama, and that kind of thing. And when I started learning about who he was, it was just so depressing. And I was watching a, uh, a GOP event. And, you know, for all I disrespect on the GOP, you know, they at least gave a voice to Andrew Breitbart that, that – uh, that, that showed him to me. And so Breitbart, if people don't know him or know who he was or anything, Breitbart was a, was a liberal in, uh, who grew up in Hollywood, California. And Breitbart uh, uh, helped found the Huff Huffington Post. He eventually had an epiphany and came to conservatism, left the Huffington Post and formed Breitbart.com, which is, of course, one of the biggest conservative news sites that's out there. In any case, Breitbart was a great speaker. But I, I was watching this event, and I'm like, who is this guy? And he's this behemoth of a man. He was like this, you know, he talked about a tsunami. It's like Breitbart. When, you know, when we <laughs> met Breitbart and saw him in person, he was so like a Bill Clinton-esque type guy, you know, just big, you know. I mean, and, and, you know, his hair's all sticking up on this on this thing, and I'm watching this YouTube video. I'm like, wow, who the hell is this guy? He's so passionate about what he's doing. And he looked in the camera, you know, and he said, the old media is dead. You are the new media. He's like looking at the camera. He's not looking at the crowd, you know. It was like, wow, that guy is talking to me, you know. It's like, <laughs> and, and I thought, wow, the camera. And then I had seen, I, it, it was almost simultaneous 
with someone on Oregon Conservatives, which is a, a, a secret Facebook group here in Oregon, okay? And I'm, I'm not in it anymore. I've been thrown out of it, which tells you a lot about the inside politics of the conservative movement here in, in Portland, okay? But in any yeah. case, someone there was looking for someone to go down and video something, something called the Bus Project. And I had no idea what the hell the Bus Project was. Honestly, I was clueless. I had never heard about it, didn't know what it was. Then it started telling people about it. They're like, oh, my God, the Bus Project. Do you know what that is? Don't you know who Jefferson Smith was? Who is a representative now? Okay, by the way, another good thing about him running for mayor is the guy turned out to be a what? Well, anyway, I'll call him a wife beater. I'll call him a wife beater. It wasn't his wife. He beat up some girl when he was in college, okay? And then he said it was just a slap, and then she finally came forward, and apparently it wasn't just a slap. So don't oh, forget, wow. when you support the, Je uh, the bus project, you're supporting Jefferson Smith, who is still on the board, okay? And, is a, it, and you talk about violence against women and the war on women. These are the people who liberals uh, hold forward, people like Jefferson Smith who actually hit a woman in the face when he was in college. And, was, and I believe he was convicted of something there. I'm not sure. Wow. I think they got that expunged after a while. But in any case, uh, uh, where was I there? Okay, so how did I get involved? I went down and started filming the bus project. And from that, I got to meet James, James O'Keefe. He saw the work that I was doing on the bus project. And, he, and uh, he noticed my work, and he came out here to Oregon. We had a chance to meet, and James is a good friend of mine now. I don't do the hidden camera stuff like James does, but, but uh, he, and you know, and so we came out of both, and, and eventually, I had a long story, I had a, ch I had a chance to meet Breitbart and be in one of his films, but um, both James and I were someone that Breitbart saw and said, Breitbart had a way of, like, cutting through the bullshit, and he could see the people who were really contributing and doing something, and people who were just running around bellyaching all the time, okay? And Breitbart knew because he had built this website, and he knew what real value was, and James had come to him with his videos, okay? So uh, for those of you uh, who don't know, uh, James is the person who uh, took down, oh, what is it, uh, the multi-billion dollar organization, voter fraud organization, I can't even think of the name of it right now, with the pimp and the uh, prostitute. Acorn. And James took, yeah, he took down Acorn. And, and so Breitbart had seen that in James, and for me, it was during the Occupy phase that Breitbart, really, he's, he had seen some of them, like when I got beat up at a Kids Hover event, he carried that, okay? But, he, but we had slowly made it so that, you know, I had his phone number, okay? I had never spoken to him, but we were changing texts. We weren't going through Twitter or anything like that. We had the direct line. And so during mm -hmm. Occupy, I just, I just kept tweeting and just kept sending him directly my, uh, texting him my videos. And just going, hey, did you see this? They just beat up the news crew down at Occupy here in Portland, and he put those videos up, and he knew they were my video. And I believe he had a connection, a personal connection to Christina Ribali, who's also an awesome person. She's like, she, uh, she's gone to Freedom Works now, and she's at a national level, and she's the person who got me to meet Glenn Beck and to be on the Glenn Beck program and all that. Christine, Christina's so awesome. But I think when she had seen Breitbart in person, she said, oh, yeah, daylightdisinfectant.com, that's Dan Sandini, and he's real. I mean, this was a guy who, and really, I am exactly what I say I am. I'm a guy who retired out here, and to me, to begin with, it was sort of like ham radio, okay? Me and another guy who runs laughing at liberals down here was like, see how many people we can reach, how many views can we get. You know, uh, um, how much impact can we have? Who, what, how big of a website can you get your video up on? And, it, and my God, when you see your video, I can't tell your listeners this enough. It is no amount of money is ever going to replace being able to see your video on The Blaze, your video <laughs> on Breitbart, to see, uh, to see Glenn Beck say, hey, I want, they had, this is what happened out in Portland, Oregon okay, run the video on the Glenn Beck program, and it's my video, okay, that's up there. It's like, oh, my God, you know? It's like, and, and, and you're getting, you know, hundreds of thousands of views on your video. It's like there's nothing more than knowing that you're having that kind of impact. So how did I get started? It was just going down to these events, just turning on your camera, and anybody can do it. Just paste your links around. All of these mm -hmm. channels have, have, as you know, Mac, have um, tip channels on them. Uh, that's how my stuff gets seen on Breitbart now. I don't really have a personal connection to Breitbart.com right now. When they ran, like they ran an Occupy video of mine on May 1st last year, they were worshiping a golden bull. I don't know if you saw that, Mac. <laughs> Did you see that video? But no, I didn't Portland, see that they made a, Yeah, they made a golden bull. It was just like 
the golden calf scene. I'm not a biblical scholar, but that's out of Moses, right? Wow. So, uh, you know what, out of Exodus. And they were, they were dancing and singing around it and praising it. And I'm like, oh, my God. And the Blaze picked it up, and, you know, it just went from there. Manny Martinez, there's really no personal, you know, personal connection there. A friend of a friend knew somebody at the Blaze and, and sent them my video. So it's, you know, it's just getting involved, going to these events. And your mm -hmm. listeners, they have a huge advantage that I don't have anymore. I, I run out of disguises, people. They know me no matter where. I'm not kidding you. And, Mac, shut me off if I, run, if I run too long. But I went down to an Occupy event with an Occupy mask on, and that was probably two years ago now. And one of the head guys down there walked up to me and said, I was wearing an Occupy mask and a disguise. And the guy walked up to me and said, hi, Dan. And I'm like, <laughs> I turned to him and said, how did you know? And you just said your watch, you know. So they know my watch. You know, it's just like there's going to be something. They know six foot four. You know, I can't afford enough video cameras, okay. You I've can't my, hide. You know, I, right, I can't hide anymore. But you, the listener right now, for the one person who's listening to my voice right now, okay, you have the power to wear a tie-dye T-shirt. You have the power to not take a shower for three days. You have the power to go down to one of these events unrecognized in the middle of it and just turn the camera on and if they don't know you there you are going to get YouTube gold I am telling you because all you have to do to get a liberal to say stupid shit oh, sorry I hope I didn't lose some sort of FCC license there but all, state the stupid stuff all you have to do is turn the camera on just turn it on you're going to get something I guarantee it guarantee it and if somebody if I'm wrong I'll tell you what I'll buy you dinner if somebody's out there and says, hey I went to a event I got nothing uh, and you know what? And I'll say if you've got nothing, you haven't looked at what you – you haven't looked at what you got down because what's happening is, is people are showing themselves for exactly who they are because they exactly. don't know you're there. Okay? They're exactly. not expecting you. You know, w one thing that I'm actually going to be doing here in the future is going to some of these kind of events, uh, liberal-type events, progressive-type events, and I'm just going to say outrageous things. Uh, you know, like, hey, why don't we, you know, take these gun owners and put them in forced concentration camps and put them to work and, 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 and actually make them be a benefit to society and see what some of these people say because, you know, it, some of these people don't want to say it until they, somebody else says it first. And then they're like, yeah, that's a good idea. You know, why don't we do that? It, it, I'm just going to say the most outrageous things and, and just see the kind of reaction that I get out of these people, but, you know, e even I, and I'm small time, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm just getting my feet in the water here as, as far as I'm concerned, and, uh, you know, I, I am already getting recognized out at Vince. That CRC, uh, the uh, light rail protest that we went to, uh, I right. had a, uh, a, a security guard up there come up to me and say, hey, you're Mac Worley, and I'm like, oh, crap, I'm already being recognized. It's not good, you know, so, uh, that, you know, I, I know what you're, you're talking about on that. You know, one question I have uh, in regards to this, because, you know, for me, this is all about, it, you know, exercising my rights, standing up for what's right, you know, it, acknowledging that there is right and wrong in the world, and it, it's not like the, the left wants us to think where there's a gray area, and it's okay to be, to, to be a crappy person and to violate other people's rights, and, and that not everybody has rights, and that the government is the p people that give you those rights, and they can take them away whenever you want. No, I believe that... that Everyone has innate human rights, no matter who they are. You know, it, it doesn't matter your, your race, your sex, you know, your, your sexual orientation. Everybody was born with these rights, whether they're American or not. They all have these rights. So this, to me, I look at it as, as my patriotic duty to, to stand up and try to motivate people to actually get out and get on the move. I mean, that's the name of the show. Go do something, you know, for your country. And, you know, my question yeah, to you, sir. that's a great name for your show. Get on the yeah, move. Yeah. Exactly right. That's what we're telling people to do. Yeah, get on the move. Right? Absolutely. Don't just, don't my, just, my don't just uh, you, armchair quarterback it. Absolutely. My, my question to you is, what does it mean to you to be a patriot? Yeah. Uh, oh, being, a, being a patriot to me, you know, I can never be – this is how I feel about it, okay? I can never be a patriot in the sense of the Minutemen, okay? I can, because I just don't have that kind of fighting instinct in me. I, trust me, I've been in conflict situations here in the States, been punched in the face with my camera, you know, been shoved around by these people, spit on. And I just know just the amount of horrible feeling that comes into my life 
that just from those small things, what would what, someone I think with military experience like yourself would think of as small things. You know, I'm a bit of a wuss when it comes when it comes to that. And I was in ROTC for a year in college, and I just knew that that was not for me. But I've tried to, from my own perspective, do what I can to be Thomas Paine for now. And it is not without its downsides. I, I can make it sound like it's totally fun, but it is, it's sacrificing. So being a patriot is sacrificing. And it's have people say terrible things about you online and have it be there for the, for the record. You know, in the long run, you, you know, the, the truth is going to be there. And people are going to look at things, you know, from the perspective that, of the truth. But for a long time, there's, there, you know, there was definitely just the negative spin on what I was doing that was, that was out there. And I've learned how to combat that. And James O'Keefe, too, and I've talked to him about this that way. We, you know, we both have suffered a lot from this sort of negative stuff. Breitbart was the kind of guy who honestly didn't care, okay? I mean, he, he loved that. And, and, you know, it brought attention onto him. But I have to say that when, you know, when Anonymous doxes you, and, it, you know, the, 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 if you, people don't know what doxing is, you know, it's taking all of your personal information and putting it in one spot in a paste bin online so that everybody can, can know, you know, it makes you a target for identity theft, you know, and, and for people, you know, like um, uh, Shanahan, you know, he, he, he was also in Breitbart.com with me, and he's had these people call the Department of Social Services, you know, on him for his children, you know, just put in false phone calls. They have to be investigated, you know what I mean? And so mm -hmm. there is this downside to the negative publicity. The left is going to come after you. And what you have to remember, when that happens, when Blue Oregon, which is the big organization here, hates on me, when Carla hates on me from the Blue Oregon, or when Jeff, you know, people like Jeff Mapes, okay, from the Oregonian, write bad things about you. They write lies about you in the newspaper, okay, and they don't do their, uh, diligent, do their due diligence. It brings attention to you. And the thing that you have to learn is you have to turn it around on that. And you have a microphone with which to fight back. And these people do not want the truth about them getting out, and they will learn mm -hmm. fairly quickly. If you back – and that will be the one piece of advice that if people, you know, in your listening audience – decide to, you know, take up the gauntlet and begin to be citizen journalists and you get some of this negative publicity against you, I would say be out in the open when you publish your stuff and put your name on it. That's what I would say because when you get good, they are going to figure out who you are anyway. Okay, so have that up front. And then the second thing is is don't back down. They, they will sense weakness immediately. They will sense someone who is easily intimidated and you need to fight back against that. I don't know if you saw my recent video, but – the state police came up to me when I was trying to videotape uh, Governor Kitzhaber a few weeks ago. I don't know if you saw that or not, but the state did, cop yeah. walked up to me. Yeah, state cop, 20,000 views. Go to, my, go to my YouTube channel right now, daylightdisinfectant.com, uh, uh, or go, uh, that's my website, or go to YouTube forward slash daylightdisinfectant, youtube.com forward slash daylightdisinfectant, all one word. You're going to see this video in my uploads of this uh, state trooper who were the bodyguards for Kitzhaber who comes up to me, okay, and says, do you have a gun on you today, okay? That is intimidation by the police. That cop, you want to talk about your Fourth Amendment rights being violated. How does that person know that I have a concealed carry? And why are they trying to intimidate me like that? I am of no danger to anybody. I have no criminal record whatsoever. I'm sure they've run background checks on me and whatever, mm -hmm. okay? But why? And the only reason why the cops have done that, and the only reason why they've said that, and believe me, I know there's some great cops out there, and I could tell that these cops who have come to my house now to try and intimidate me, okay? And I won't give them the time of day, okay? That these cops, there are really good cops that are out there, and they are just doing the dirty work of these politicians. But you have to be willing to stare that straight in the face. And the first thing that I did, turn on your video camera. The second thing, put it up on YouTube. Because the truth is the truth. And, and these cops are not going to want to be tagged with having to do that kind of work. Okay? And Kitzhaber suffered because of that. He looks like a thug. And it's turning out now that he is a thug. And he is a crook. Mm -hmm. okay? Because he knew about Cover Oregon a year ago. He knew about the problems on this website a year ago. And the only reason why he is pushing back that hard why he won't talk to the citizen journalists and why he won't give people interviews and he'll walk out on interviews, okay, is because he does not want the truth getting out. 
And that's what people have to do to fight back against that, never back down against these people. Always be willing to tell the truth and put it up on the web, and, you'll, and things are going to be fine. Because in the end, the truth ends up, uh, ends up capturing the day. The truth will rule the day. The video speaks for itself. I agree. I, I totally agree. And I, I watched that video, and I was just in shock at, at what happened. And, and most importantly, I, you know, I was like, man, that guy has some balls on him. I was like, I, I, Dan, that's, that's the man right there. Uh, you know, it, you, you just, you know, ran head, head first into this thing. And, you know, that's what we have to do. You know, we have to not show any weakness, like you were saying, and just go for it and not be afraid. You know, it, the, the pursuit of truth is, is worth consequences because, I mean, at some point, you know, it, this all this stuff is going to come to light. And, uh, you know, what, I, I got a, a few more questions here for you. Uh, it, we'll kind of combine them here. Uh, as far as, you know, the name of your uh, your uh, website and everything, Daylight Disinfected, I'd, li I'd like it if you take a second to explain that. But also, I, I'm curious, uh, you know, what the future holds for Daylight Disinfectant. Okay. Uh, where I got the name of the site was Christina Rabali. And uh, your listeners have heard me mention her name before. Uh, if your listeners get a chance to Mac, I would highly recommend that you somehow scrounge up the change to go to BlogCon, which is FreedomWorks' big bloggers conference every year. Christina Rabali is basically the person who does all the work that's behind that. She's just an amazing, first of all, she's the blonde mom shell of the conservative movement. She's gorgeous, okay? Unfortunately, <laughs> she's already taken. But Christina was one of the founding members of the original Tea Party here in Oregon. She's an amazing person. And I, when I had one of my videos one time, I was talking to her on the phone, and I believe she gave me a quote from a famous judge. And people will have to look that up on the web because I can't remember the judge's name. But in a ruling, he said that it was about being able to publish, uh, about First Amendment rights in the United States. And it was let sunlight be the best antiseptic. And it's exactly what we were just talking about is that in the end, the truth rules out. And so when I went to look for I was like, what can I call this thing? Because I, I think really the only YouTube channel I had before was this stupid Governor Kitzhaber channel. And it's like, not everything I do has to do with Governor Kitzhaber. So what am I going to put, put as his name? And something about when she said sunlight and antiseptic, I said, ah, let's look around and see if that's out there. And I looked for sunlight and antiseptic. That wasn't there. Daylight and antiseptic wasn't there. And so I, I kind of changed the words around a little bit. So I came out with, instead of sunlight, it's daylight. And instead of uh, antiseptic, it's disinfectant, which turns out to be this just really ugly name, you know, like daylight disinfectant. But, you know, because it makes people think about stuff that's under their sink. But it's, <laughs> and nobody wants to think about what's under your sink, right? But it's, it's like, anyway, uh, it's, you know, it's, it, it's something that people can remember, I guess. And, and uh, so I've just used it. What's the future hold for me? Uh, I'm looking into closed, I, I really would like to look at studio production. Um, I had a chance to be in uh, Breitbart's movie, uh, and his, uh, his movie Occupy Unmasked, and I really liked that. And I had a chance to take some acting classes here in Portland, of all things. Just I have a lot of little interests and stuff that I like to sort of delve into. I did that, and I really like being on camera. And so I started taking classes down at uh, Portland Community, Community Media. Their next class on digital media production, I, you know, I try to talk you into it. I think you're going to try and go to a future one. But yeah, uh, the... the um, but uh, their classes start on Tuesday, um, and once, you, once you're approved inside, uh, once you, you get certified through taking their classes, and then you can actually do uh, digital media production inside their studios. And if you produce your own stuff, like all of my videos and stuff, I'll be able to put out on the air from – they have some stations on uh, cable, closed-circuit cable television here that go all the way from Gresham to Beaverton and Hillsborough. So oh, you wow. occupiers who thought it was okay to destroy our city, be ready to see your names and faces out on uh, – that's, a, that's one of my next steps is to put you out on uh, closed circuit ca uh, cable television and to start to do little studio productions. Uh, uh, so that's the next place I'm going to go. And I want to continue to do radio. I've done some fill-in. Uh, I've uh, filled in for Jane Carroll, another awesome person here in the Portland area. Jane Carroll, who's, uh, um, she is the first lady of talk radio here in Portland. She's up at KUIK. It's KUIK.com on the web. She runs a show, Jane Carroll Show, from 3 to 6 o'clock. I'm on there every other week. So we do a show on there called The Daily Dish. I was on last Monday, and I think I'm going to ask her if I could be on this Monday. Usually it's biweekly, but I think I'm going to call her tomorrow uh, because I got this video on Cover Oregon on Thursday. But she'll hear me on there at 3.30, 3.35 every Monday. I'm on that show. And I've actually filled in for Jane before. I loved it. And sometimes I'm on her show, The Conservative Council. So, I mean, I love doing radio. 
and uh, I, I, I really want bigger videos. I, I, I want to get to more events. I want to video more things and get more of the truth out there. Just more of the same, and then also sort of delving into studio production, I guess, and being on the radio, Mac, will be where I'm going. Awesome. Awesome. Well, you know, I, I really enjoyed having you on the show, and you're welcome back here anytime you want. Just let me know if you have anything that you want to promote, you know, whether it's five minutes or the whole show like we've been doing. Uh, like like I said, this has been an amazing interview with you, I, you know, and you're one of the, the nicest people I've ever met at, out at these events. I mean, you know, you're just really easy to talk to, and I really appreciate what you've been doing, and I just hope you keep it up. I will keep it up, Mac, and that, the feeling is mutual. You're a super nice guy. If any of your folks see me at events, come and tap me on the shoulder. I'm six foot four, the big gawky guy with the video camera that uh, couldn't be more obvious when he's trying to fill somebody who's not uh, in a non-obvious way. Just come up and tap me on the shoulder. You can always reach me through my website, daylightdisinfectant.com, on Twitter at daylightdis. That's daylightdis. I have to go shorter on that. And it's YouTube forward slash daylightdisinfectant for all the videos. Please be sure to subscribe and like me on Facebook. And we'll see you uh, out on the videos. Awesome. Well, well, thanks again for coming on, Dan. And uh, everybody, go check out his stuff. He's got really amazing stuff. At this point, we're going to go ahead and take a quick uh, break, and we'll be back, and I'll wrap up the last five minutes of the show. Thanks. on the move help us make this podcast bigger and better you can do this by going to our store and purchasing one of our hundreds of products all designs are original and made for patriots like you just go to cafepress.com slash on the move show we appreciate your support need design services logo design for ninety dollars business cards brochures bumper stickers signs flyers promotional products such as mugs pins bags keychains, magnets, and so much more. Contact Latasha Worley for a quote on your next project at Tasha, T-O-S-H-A, at lworleyphotography.com today. Or visit me on the web at lworleyphotography.com. And on Facebook at facebook.com slash lworleyphotography. And on Twitter at twitter.com slash Tasha Worley. Show your support for a designer who believes in the Constitution and your rights. And we're back. Okay, when we last left the show, we had uh, Dan Sandini of the Daylight Disinfectant on the show. And we're going to go ahead and wrap up the show here with uh, another portion, another segment of the show that we like to call the Listener Challenge. I challenge you to a duel. Did you hear that? Sounds like it's time for a challenge. Listener Challenge. Listener Challenge. Listener Challenge. Alright, last week I asked you to talk to an Obama supporter, a liberal, or a progressive to find out what they're thinking. Uh, if you could email the show at onthemoveshow at gmail.com and let us know what they said, we'll read it off live on the air. Today's mission, if you choose to accept it, is to thank a veteran uh, for their service. These men and women put their lives on the line every time they put on the uniform, not just overseas, but here at home as well. They're targets for terrorists. They are on the front line of the war on terror. I challenge you to tell them how, you, how much you appreciate their sacrifices and to let them know that you'll go to bat for them if they need you to. I would also like to take a moment to acknowledge the tragic deaths of our U.S. service members and the two recent helicopter crashes that took place this week. First, on January 7, 2014, a U.S. Air Force military helicopter crashed on the coast of eastern England, killing all four crew members on board. And then, on January 8, 2014, a U.S. Navy helicopter with five uh, members aboard crashed at sea off Norfolk, Virginia. The helicopter went down in the Atlantic Ocean 20 miles off the Virginia coast. Three of the crew members were rescued, and they were, ser- and, and they were searching for the fifth crew member. Unfortunately, on, on Thursday, January 9, 2014, they called off the search for the missing fifth member. Captain John Little, Coast Guard Section Commander, said, we are not looking, but we are on the scene uh, in if you know on the scene present. We have an on the scene presence. There we go. Uh, these men and women they paid the ultimate price for their country, and I hope you will join me in honoring them with a moment of silence.
All right. So that's our show for today. I really appreciate everyone who, who listened, and I appreciate Dan Sandini of The Daylight Disinfectant uh, for being a guest on the show. Uh, if you guys would like to join the conversation next week, give us a call. The telephone number is 619-924-0986. 619-924-0986, or you can email the show at onthemoveshow at gmail.com with your questions. Um, I want to thank our listeners. Thank you so much for tuning in week after week. We really appreciate your continued support. Don't forget to check us out at onthemoveshow.com, here at blogtalkradio.com forward slash onthemoveshow, facebook.com forward slash onthemoveshow, youtube.com forward slash onthemoveshow, twitter.com forward slash onthemoveshow. And as always, Know your rights. Assert your rights. Get on the move.